Hello, everybody. This is the real story of the greatest snooker final of all time. Let's begin at the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. The date, April 27th, 1985. Let me introduce your finalists. First, a player looking to cast off the tag of Nearly Man, fresh from his Grand Prix win, hoping to go one step further than he ever has at the Crucible. The 36 year old, smiling Irish man, Dennis Taylor! Next, a man as serious on the base as he is off it. He's 27 years old and he's already won this title three times. He is the world number one. He is your number one seed. Please welcome Rumford Slim, Steve Davis! The famous snooker theme tune, but then again, in 1985, every sports theme was popular. Everybody knew them because you didn't need a satellite dish, you just needed the BBC. The music that acted as a cue to a roll call of very famous names. In 1985, there were only four channels, so if you presented sport on the telly, you were as famous as the players themselves. Hello there. Well, a pretty frustrating weekend all round for rugby players. Tonight we concentrate on the Winter Olympics. Well, that's it as far as I'm concerned. After the famous Crucible Theatre here in Sheffield, which has seen a few dramas in its time, gearing itself up for the last lap of the 1985 World Professional Snooker Championship. It is, as I say, a remarkable final, and I'm glad you're with us to enjoy it here tonight. I remember absolutely nothing of the last day, other than David Vine. And if someone had told us that 18 and a half million people were going to be tuned in... But as the hour reaches midnight, this final frame has now been in progress some 45 minutes. I think it was a trauma. We were out of our depth. Both players under a great strain. That particular night, I mean, Snooker was the winner there, really. The fact that I was involved in something where so many people remember what they were doing and where they were when they were watching it, you know, wow. To me, the 85 final meant staying up late. I was seven years old and had never seen the other side of midnight. It sounds silly, but that's the point, really. It was more than just a snooker game, and it meant so many things to so many different people. And I'm going to try and harness that. I'm going to travel to all four home nations, and I'm going to start at our southernmost tip on the Isle of Wight, because in the beginning, there was David Icke. David Icke was, if you like, the Robin, the David Vines Batman, so he's the perfect person to catch up with first on our travels and find out a little bit more about the tournament as a whole. David, Colin, I'm in your control. Where do you want to go? Let's go home. Excellent. Twenty-five years ago, there'd be people watching now who weren't born. If you could just explain to me where snooker was. What was the state of the game? Well, snooker had been a real in-the-shadows uh, sport, and then uh, the BBC had the Pop Black programme, and that gave it some public profile. This is the last Pop Black, the last edition of the longest-running snooker programme in the world. The programme that did so much to launch snooker into its modern era and the multi-million pound industry we see today. It was absolutely massive. They were kind of, in British terms, they were, they were superstars. They were everywhere, these guys. And, and a lot of them had, had been in the game in the early days when they were thumbing a lift between exhibition games. And it happened so fast. 
the final, David is the most famous snooker match there has been, probably ever will be. But before that, there was a lot of frames and a lot of games. What type of tournament was it up until that point? It was a real struggle that year. Uh, we had one really good game, I remember, between Ray Reardon and John Parrott, went to 13-12 to Ray. But the rest of them, players were winning games comfortably, and we had so much time to fill. <laughs> When you're building the, to the climax of a tournament over two weeks and now you're filling time with knockabout exhibition games because the, the, the semi-final has been over so easily, then you think, well, this is a bloody nightmare of a tournament coming up. Well, Steve Davis, he's really riding on the crest of a wave at the moment, brimful of confidence. I was probably in the mentally as good a shape as you could get. And Dennis had reached embarrassment territory, which is the ideal situation to get a player in. You know, then you've got to just drill him into the ground. Well, I wonder what uh, Dennis is thinking. I thought, what's going on here? It was a bit embarrassing. I wanted the floor to open up in the crucible, and I just didn't know where I was going. I thought, when am I going to get a proper chance? Well, a perfect performance by Steve Davis. Eight frames to nil. When Steve went eight nil up in the final, you thought this is the disaster tournament of all world championships that have been covered. In 1985, I was nine. My parents allowed me to stay up to watch the final. I was so tired, my eyes were straining to keep awake. This year we'll see my 14th visit to the Crucible. I even met my husband to be there. In the 80s, it wasn't just the presenters who took centre stage. Take a walk into any commentary box and you'd find giants of broadcasting. Taken by Smith, lovely pass inside by Smith. The Scotch like bloodhounds on the scent here. Steve Ovett coming home to take the gold medal. Yes, it's he's up to fourth position ahead of Schumacher. Many over his money, Johnson is second and third is more prop boy. Oh, I see what about it. Your snooker had its very own monarch of the mic and Ted Lowe whispered his way through that classic 85 final. He's 90 this year, he still loves snooker and he's kindly agreed a little bit further up the south coast to let me come to his house. Well, Colin, this one is uh, presented to me uh, after my 50 years by friends and colleagues at the BBC, which I treasure. It's the old-fashioned mic, as you can see. Lovely piece, that. What's and it it's... like to have uh, friends at the BBC? I'm, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm still I, trying to get some. I've had that. Um, <laughs> quite a number over the course of uh, years, and uh, they've uh, all died on me, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's fine. <Yeah>. You're here. <laughs> when the camera panned to Dennis Taylor spending most of his time on his derriere and, and Davis at the table, what type of figure did Dennis Taylor cut as the score went up and up and up and he hadn't won a single frame in the first eight? Dennis produced uh, a sad picture when he sat in that lonely chair and you could see the terrible agony he was going through as each frame went against him. Well, perhaps uh, Dennis was saying a little prayer there. Uh, he was very close to his mum. The year before this particular final, he lost her. And there was something within him, I, 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 don't, I can't explain it, that he was doing this for his mum. I was just going to go out and play and try and win the tournaments for my mum, you know, in memory of my mum. You know, that seat in the crucible, even though the people are so close to you, can be one of the loneliest seats in sport. There was a couple of fellas behind me, I, I remember chatting to them every now and again, it was something I always used to do anyway. Uh, so with the boys and chatting away to my mum, it, 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 kept, it kept me focused but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a pretty place to be sitting, I can tell you. Of course it, it was almost hard for Dennis to look lonely or depressed because he had his ridiculous glasses on. Well, yes, this is true because I always said that if Dennis didn't play snooker, he could have been a great comedian, you know. <laughs> and these specs of his helped him a great deal. 
Um, originally, he got them from uh, my dear old mate, Jack Carnham. Jack Carnham was more than just a commentator. He was the inventor of glasses, a billiards champion, and responsible for arguably one of the greatest lines of snooker commentary ever. Oh, good luck, mate. Timeless moment. Uh, Jack's son lives in Hampshire. His name's Richard, and he's invited me down to talk about the legend of the specs and the, the invention of his father. As far as I'm aware, he was the first man to say under the cosh on television. Right. Um, which was... We all use that now. Yeah, it mm. is. It's almost de rigueur, isn't it, for a sports commentator? What's it mean? I mean... It actually means it's a thing from fly fishing if you catch a trout. And you take it out of the water, you cosh it. Well, you bash it, yeah, under the cosh. So, you know, if you're under a great deal of pressure, like you're about to get bashed around the head, you, you're under the cosh. Dennis must have definitely felt like a trout <laughs> out of the water well under the going cosh, in that second yeah. session. Yeah, must have been. Father Jack's glasses would have um, been coming in for a little bit of stick, a little bit of ridicule. Yeah, so they were always coming in for ridicule. In fact, my father got a lot of ridicule when he first designed them, but... Uh, they were incredibly effective because I remember Dennis worrying about his eyesight was going and Dad said, well, try a pair of these clown's glasses on. And uh, they suited Dennis well. That's not bad. I think there's only one way to, to say goodbye to you and, and that's just to say good luck, mate. <laughs> Thank you. Don't you forget about me a liberty, a small liberty, with uh, a ball down the rail into the green pocket. He stretched across the table to pot a green. If the green goes in the corner pocket, it's 9-0. Well, Steve Davis there at full stretch, in fact, overstretched. I potted the green to pink to win my first frame. At last, one for Taylor, one out of nine. The crowd all cheered in sort of, you know, relief. Dennis sort of, you know, made fun of, you know, in, in a way. It seemed like, you know, what can you do? You can only go, oh, great, I won a frame, you know, for the fun of it, really, because, you, you know, the re relief as well. And, um, and then the tide turned and I collapsed. Steve grew up in south-east London and it was here at the Plumstead Working Man's Club where a little scrawny 12-year-old first showed signs of what would be a remarkable career. And where he actually learnt the game was on that bottom table playing billiards by rolling the ball up and down the table, over the spots, backwards and forwards, and by placing a ball somewhere near the middle hole and going in off of that ball into the middle hole, but controlling it so that that other ball that was on the table, the other white, would come back into an almost identical spot. So Roy Kenwood tells me you spent every day as a kid on a billiard table rolling the ball just up and down. <laughs> yeah, gee whiz. Well, I mean, the early days for me of practice were about following the Joe Davis blueprint for the game. And my father was very much not a disciplinarian, but a stickler for practice and technique. He played snooker, of course. We played snooker on his table, uh, you know, sort of friendly matches. But that's where he learnt the control of the ball, the pace of the ball, direction into which it was going to go. My father never told me to play snooker. Uh, it was all, all of my drive, really. Um, he, he was just delighted that I liked the game. And, you know, effectively, we'd go down the club together, you know, father and son. I thought at that stage he would be the world billiard champion. Yes, I did. I did. I came in here one night and he said to me, do you want to see under a break, Roy? I said, yeah. And he placed two balls on the cushions and the third one was there. Vertically with his cue, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, four, six, twenty, a hundred. And anyway, you, you try and do it, You'll, the balls will and it was a control. Because my father would be sort of fairly defensive about, you know, don't go for the big shot. You know, you always play within yourself. So if I pushed the boat out, as it's commonly known in the snooker uh, uh, commentary box, and went for a shot that was risky, I'd always get the criticism afterwards. 
Well, his father must have been doing something right because with more than half a century on the board, the man is still playing to the highest level. You've just walked out of the Crucible for the 30th time and got that love. It's lovely that the fact of, there's a lot of people obviously appreciate the world of snooker and the characters in it and the fact that that, that reception was quite amazing. All I could say is that if, if it was me in the crowd and I'd watched snooker all these years and there was somebody who'd done what I did, I think I'd have to stand up and go, well, look, even if I didn't like you as a player, well done. It was 25 years ago that Steve Davis, along with Dennis Taylor, had us on the edges of the seat. Fast forward a quarter of a century, and Davis is at it again. Back in 1985, there wasn't much to shout about, really. The minor strike had just ended a month before the World Snooker Final, and the country, I suppose you could say, was at war with itself. And at the end of this time, our people are suffering tremendous hardship. So maybe Britain as a whole just needed a hero, or at the very least, a bit of escapism. Uh, this is South Wales. It uh, would have been a mining village. All the mines are, are closed now. So I doubt in April 1985, they cared a huge amount about a snooker final, but there was one little boy lived out there called Mark Williams. He was 10 years old. He was the son of a miner, and he would go on to win two world titles. And I, I just have a feeling his memories might be a little bit different. So you're three years into your playing career. You're one of the hottest prospects in Britain. You're about to win your first youth trophy, but you didn't watch the <laughs> 1985 final? No, I never. I mean, I can't remember watching it. You know, at the time, there was uh, you know, the miners' strike and all the stuff happening with, with the miners' thing, and uh, you know, there was uh, a lot more important things happening at that time with uh, everything, and, and I just didn't get to see it. Remember, used to go picketing with my old man and that. He'd be like 30, 40 people here kicking a football around. All of a sudden, this bus will come, going into the pit. It just it's like if he turned the uh, maniacs. It's yeah. like throwing stones at the bus and just oh, trying to stop you getting in. Like incredible. You, you, it's hard to understand when you're young. What, why didn't you just? If, if they can go into work to get money, why don't you just do it as well? Mm -hmm. But then, like at the time, you, you could you could get killed. Like if you had been watching on the Saturday night, the second session of that final. I mean, Taylor came from from eight down and finished that session just nine seven behind. Both players then would have had to go to bed. What do you think, you know, as somebody who's been in these situations, would have been in their head? Well, well the pressure reverses. I mean, once you're eight frames behind, I mean, uh, you know, you sit there, you, you must think to yourself, you know, you can't win, really. You're just going to try and make the score respectable. You, you, you don't expect to win. And, and then all of a sudden, you, you, you start, your arm loosens up, you start potting a few balls, making some breaks. Steve Davis, I can't imagine, would have been the most popular snooker player in Coombe. Probably not, because he used to win everything. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, we're a good old country for uh, not liking people uh, winning. I mean, I think that's our trademark. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, he's got more popular now he's losing. The British sporting public do not warm to winners, to people who win day in, day out. Was, did that hurt you? A little bit, not much, I could, because I could understand it, because I'm also British. So 29 all after 43 minutes of really dogged doer snooker. But some of the frames I won in the evening session, I was winning them with frame winning breaks. Yeah. And the last six frames, I kept Steve in his seat for most of the evening. Overnight, the score had been 9-7 to me, and it had been 7 all and I won the last two frames. It would have been a t completely different night's sleep. As it was, uh, uh, I, I stole, I think, a line from Colin, pa Colin Powell, which was, uh, you know, like I slept like a baby, I woke up screaming every half an hour. <laughs> I, you know, what an awful, you know, I mean, I, my world had collapsed. So Mark Williams didn't even watch the 1985 final. He's one of just a few, I would imagine. There was a, a, a player who actually turned pro at the age of 16, the youngest ever in the game in its entire history. Um, and he lives just round the corner from Stirling Castle. He did all right after he turned pro. He, he won seven world titles, so I think he'll have something to say. You're eight frames up, but you go to bed and you wake up that next morning for the second day and it's... It's 9-7, you're only two frames ahead. What's going through Steve's head at that stage? 
I wouldn't like that feeling um, because I think it's 8 0 up. EB want to, you know, get Dennis down and put his foot in his throat, sort of thing, and just finish him off as quickly as possible. That's what I'd be thinking. Whether you like them or not, whether it's your best pal, you want to really destroy them and, and, and humiliate them if possible. That's what I was like. But yeah, then you're thinking, my God, what if I lose this now? So when you woke up on, on that Sunday morning, uh, as it was, of the 85 final, into session three, you would have been cheering on Steve Davis then? Or yeah. Or Dennis Taylor? Very much so. I, I, I've always been, um, in any sport I watch, I've always wanted to see the best winning, um, whether it be Steve Davis, Tiger Woods, uh, Michael Schumacher when I was into Formula One. I wanted to see the best winning. I've never been an underdog supporter. Stephen Henry as a kid, he wanted Steve Davis to win in 85. Did he? Well... I think Ronnie O'Sullivan's a great player there. I think by the third session, midway through, the nerves were there on both sides. There was one moment when it was 10-8 to Steve Davis and Dennis Taylor had a, a dolly of a black to win the frame and missed and, and went 11-8 uh, down. We all miss easy balls. You know, I've been in hundreds of scrappy matches. Well, in almost any circumstances in the world, he would have potted that in these circumstances. It proved missable. No, looking back, I think there's probably been higher standards of snooker playing finals. Oh, no rushing to the table for this fella. He's already had two bites at the cherry and appreciates just how important this black is. None of us had tickets for the final. So I queued up and I managed to get the last ticket for the final session of the final. But he completely forgot about mother and father, so we had to spend the entire evening wondering what was going on uh, in the bar of the Grosvenor House Hotel. The final, well, I'd be honest, I never thought I'd be standing here tonight introducing this last session. And you were with all the snooker journalists drinking. Heavily. And the very latest news at the end of the last session, which didn't finish more than about half an hour ago, Davis leads 13 frames to 11. 18 are required to win the £60,000 cheque. So with 11 to play, Davis needs five and Taylor needs seven. Those three sessions have gone out of history now. It's just mm. down to the last one. 13-11. Lovely. Join the match. Cheers. Steve Davis, defending snooker champion of the world, with uh, Barry Hearn just going out. He's never very far away, his manager. You see sport at 360 degrees, from the punters paying the money to get in to the entertainment on the bays or on the hockey or wherever it may be. But I think it, it's important to note that, that Steve Davis was your boy. Yeah. You go back to 1976. So for you, it wasn't just about no, the sport no. and no. the receipts. So you must have been as tired as him going in that last session. Yeah, it was like family. You know, we were in this together and we beat the world. If you go back to 1981, when he first won the World Championship, a terrible scene of me celebrating everything. Congratulations there to the Embassy World Champion Steve Davis from his manager Barry Hearn. You have to understand the emotion. You know, I'd spent five years telling everyone I had the greatest player in the world and he was my best friend and we were going to kill everybody. Yeah. And that was not just me celebrating 81, it was vindication of everything that we both set for. Steve and I would sit down in the early years and we would talk about What's it going to be like when we win the World Championship? We would have tears rolling down our face. That was the intensity of our early. We wanted, neither of us had anything, anything. Yeah. We wanted to be somebody in our chosen sports. I'd like to thank all the people from Romford and from Plumstead Cone Working Men's Club and, and everybody else all over the place. Now, take that forward to 85. We were joined at the hip. In terms, I would have taken a bullet for Steve Davis. He was so charismatic whilst I was the total opposite. But I did my job on the table, and he did the best for me off the table. And we, we got on really well, even though in another walk of life, I'd have probably been the last person he'd have ever, ever befriended. I wanted to be the manager of the World Snooker Champion, who is also my best friend. So it wasn't a question of anyone else meant nothing at all. Yeah. And suddenly all of these lovely laid out plans became questioned by some smiling Irishman that yeah. doesn't, isn't supposed to win. It didn't happen in the rehearsals in our head. <laughs> and how do we cope with this now? Because he won't go away. 
and he keeps laughing and he's smiling and he's cracking jokes in the intervals <laughs> and we don't like him. Trevor East was there. I mean, Trevor was, was great. Uh, Trevor was the head of sport with ITV at the time and he was with me throughout the whole of that championship. The mood in the dressing room had just changed dramatically from the day before. Uh, Dennis was cracking jokes, it was light-hearted, there was banter, a bit of fun, a lot of laughter. And basically Dennis knew he'd, uh, he'd almost got the game. Um, there was still a way to go, but uh, by Davis's demeanour, um, we could tell that he was really under pressure and the game had completely turned and it was there for Dennis's taking. And you could hear them, they was, they was enjoying it, you know. There was laughter coming from his dressing room, there was no laughter coming from ours. There never really was. We were serious in our business. 63. Taylor now needs snookers. Davis won that first frame. Yeah. Momentum-wise and psychologically, you would imagine that was the perfect building point. We couldn't have had a better start, but it still didn't mean anything because the winning line wasn't there. Had Davis won the frame after that, I think we'd have been into easy street. see many better thought out shots to nothing than that. Let's just pause for a minute and consider the art of snooker. Michael Myers has done this oil painting of the last frame of the 85 final. I absolutely love it. Every one of these lines is a shot played in the most famous frame of snooker ever. All 111 of them. It kind of hits home to me when I look at this that it's a science playing snooker. It's something you're naturally born with. For, for the rest of us, well, we're just rubbish at it. I think, like most sort of semi-mugs, every now and then I'll do a shot that would have got spirited applause at the grapple drum or whatever it's called. Uh, but there, there is not a shot uh, that I can't miss, you know. Even if, if it's on the very brink of the pocket and it's a straight shot, I'm just as likely to go in with, you know, or in instead, that's the other one. I'm lost in admiration for what they do out there. And also the stamina, how, you know, after four or five frames, I'm exhausted and no longer thinking very straight. And, uh, and for them, it must be a, a kind of delirium of concentration. It's fiercely psychological. I mean, you're never so far ahead that it's over until it's over. This final is now heading for uh, a very thrilling climax. I'm here in East London's Theatreland to speak to actress Cathy Murphy. You may know her from programmes such as Shameless, EastEnders and Extras. She's got a very different take on events 25 years ago. Let me take you back to 10.15 on the 29th of April. 1985, you would have been one of the few people in all of Britain not happy when you tuned into BBC Two to see Dennis Taylor and Steve Davis. No, not really, because I was 17 and I was in a BBC production called Bleak House. It was my first big break and I was really excited sitting around the TV with my family and my then boyfriend to see Bleak House. Miss Summerson, Miss Summerson, it's Mr Skimpole, Miss. He's been took. Mr Carson said, would you come? Has Mr Skimpole been taken ill? Took me sudden. And instead, this snooker match went on and on and on. And I think it finished at about 12.15, which meant Bleak House started at 12.15, and who's going to watch it then? <laughs> so I wasn't best pleased. <laughs> Gentlemen, please. Shouting out upsets a player's concentration. Please don't do it. The 1985 Sports Personality of the Year was an Irishman, but it wasn't to be Dennis Taylor, it was Barry McGuigan. He too from a small town in Ireland, uh, the underdog taking on a machine. And by the time Christmas 1985 came about, both of them shared a massive affinity. What is it about the Irish where well, they have to be underdogs? I mean, Dennis never led against Steve. He was 17-15 down at this stage, and I mean, he's got to win the last three frames. No more room for error. Why, why do the Irish thrive? 
when, when we're against the wall. Lots of people say, well, well, you know, snooker players aren't real athletes, but the level of concentration that they have to have, and all the people in, in the auditorium screaming and shouting, he just showed phenomenal powers of recovery and fight back. Just amazing. Your father was this huge inspiration to you, yeah. and unfortunately, Dennis had this, this backdrop of just losing his mother, um, who was his inspiration, yeah. um, and he might not have lifted a cue again. It happened with you when you lost yeah. your father. It happened with him when he lost his mother. Yeah. Do you believe in that, the fate of it? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I believe my dad's in a better place, and I believe my brother, who committed suicide in 94, uh, I believe they're, they're with me. I, I believe that when times get tough, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's interesting. I watched the, uh, I watched Dennis between uh, those frames, and I watched um, I watched him as he sat down, mm -hmm. and I looked and thought, what is going through his his mind? What is he thinking about? Is he thinking, you know, mum, yeah. where are you? Uh, you know, come and give me the, the the strength or whatever. But he he was able to garner. Uh, the strength and the psychology and, and the, the, you know, the toughness of mind and the sureness to make those decisions, those little incremental mistakes that can destroy you. Tell me a little bit about the mid-80s. It wasn't just about what you were doing in the ring or at the table, was it? There was so many other connotations. People wanted to know your politics, your yeah, religion. Yeah. I was just sick to death of it and, and it was a tragic time for Northern Ireland. Everywhere you went, it was just so intimidating, so frightening. And I remember thinking, the one thing I want to do is I want to bring people together. I'm not going to wear any colours. I didn't want uh, to have anybody label me, and I wouldn't do that. And I suppose a certain section of, of, of uh, uh, the community wouldn't have liked that. I didn't care about those because they weren't my supporters in any case. And Dennis was exactly the same. And he was such a lovely man and such a, such a great representative. And everybody wanted him to do well and be successful. In modern sport, there's so many arrogant sportsmen and cocky and conceited uh, people and you know the world's full of that and, and, and the ordinary Joe in, in the street doesn't like that sort of arrogance. He can put up with it and tolerate it for a time but after a while and my old man used to say to me Barry just you know, keep it simple son you know, and make as many friends a, a, as you can on the way up because you see when you're on your way down they don't go oh let you slide down so just I mean I enjoy people I enjoy company and, and it's difficult for me to be rude to people and it, it's exactly the same with Dennis. Regardless of any religion, people in Northern Ireland and, and all of Ireland were, were on their feet for Dennis and were backing him. Without a doubt. I'm 325 miles from the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. I'm in Coal Island, County Tyrone, Northern Ireland, home of Dennis Taylor. And in this snooker club, Gervins, that's where he cut his teeth. And I'll tell you why I'm here. I'm interested to find out the inspiration, the strength that he got to come back again and again and again in the 85 final against the machine. Brenda's his sister. I've met her before and her husband, Seamus. Should have a welcoming committee as well. Was he a bit of an absentee brother in terms of you would know where to find him if you needed him, but he would come just come straight down here? You find him in the snooker hall. What he did do was he would have come down, he would have played a game of snooker. He didn't have any money, so the boys would have given him a cigarette. He didn't smoke, he never did. So he would have played for a cigarette. So he used to bring the cigarette up home to Mum. Mum smoked. And she would give him thruppence for the cigarette. So he would come down and play another game of snooker. So that's how he got his money to play snooker. <laughs> what was it like in here, his own snooker club, on the night of the final session? I mean, you mustn't have been able to move. It was, it was one of those moments you said to yourself, you know, is, am I really here? Is it really happening? You know, this is someone from your own town, a chance to be world champion. And everybody was engrossed in it. It was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable atmosphere. You know, and, but how the actual lead up to it, you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't write the script for it. What happened in that, that particular world final? I don't think there's been a world final like it since. All the rest, my sisters and brothers and brothers in law had all went to the yeah. final. They were all over there. And I stayed at home with Dad. I have to own up because I was whistling. Dennis Taylor. The referee had pointed to me uh, to the stewards to put me out. Gentlemen, stewards, to be instructed. Contact the person that was going to the door, please. Where is it? Lucky enough, I apologised to the stewards and <laughs> the captain. I got staying on. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> if you could be honest with me, Piers, were you thinking? You know, he's, he's had his chance, he's done the time proud, but 
it's another step too far. He can't possibly pull another frame back, let alone three. We're from Caledon, you see, we have great faith. And it's there. And the audience is thrilled as Dennis Taylor as he saves the match, now one frame behind at 17-16. But I knew at 17-15 that I really, you know, your back's against the wall, but I had to, to pull all the stops out. But I think at that stage, what helped me was I'd won six frames the night before. Yeah. So you're saying to yourself, listen, if I can win six frames, there's no reason why I can't win three, and that's what you're telling yourself. You forget sometimes how great Dennis is as a player and how great snooker he was playing at that period of, of his career. And to come back, you know, he shows you the, the character of the man. Oh. Steve Davis then concedes that particular frame and Dennis Taylor, a very satisfied Irishman, sits there with the frames all square, 17 inch. I'm in the Workman's Club in Cricklewood and the final's just gone 17-17. The bar steward is not happy. Comes from behind the bar, up to the TV, switches it off. We're all sitting there, gobsmacked. So up I get, there's a few murmurs, right? I put my finger on the TV on-off button and I hear in the background, McBride, you turn that TV on, you'll be up in front of the committee by Wednesday, that I promise you. And I'm thinking, what do I do? I thought, I can't miss this. So I switch it on. I sit back down, I get a big round of applause and we carry on watching the final. Anyway, next night, up I go for a pint of the game of snooker, there's a letter on the door for me. I open up the letter, true to his word, I'm in front of the committee on the Wednesday. Up I go to the committee on the Wednesday, barred me to three months. John Williams refereed every frame of the 85 final, and I think he had the best seat in the house. I say best seat, he wasn't allowed to sit down, but... John, you've announced the beginning of a million frames, but I'd imagine none as intense as the, the 35th frame of the 85 final. So tell me at the start of that 35th frame, who did you think was going to win the title? I honestly and sincerely hadn't got the clue. I just wanted it finished. The world champion puts the cue ball right underneath the ball cushion. When I was under extreme pressure, I used to get a little bit red in the face. <laughs> and that last frame, I remember looking at Steve. Steve was going the opposite. They were going grey by the minute, whereas you had two fairly young young gentlemen playing uh, a match, a snooker match. Suddenly, they seemed to get to middle age and then look like old age. Their, their faces were changing and uh, they just really, I think, would have preferred to have been anywhere except there for that final frame. When you get to a one-frame shootout, all you're thinking is, let me get a chance early on. Just please, let me get one chance. I don't want to have to spend the last frame sitting in the seat. Any mistake now, very expensive. This is the final frame of the World Championship 1985. I couldn't even bear to watch it in the sitting room. I couldn't bear to stay in the city. I was actually behind the door in the hall, watching through that narrow crack in the door with a hat right down over my head and every so often I would lift it up just to see how he was doing. Every time I watched on telly, Dennis would miss. <laughs> and it got to the point, and my wife, my wife Linda was, was with me, uh, that I would, I would go out the room and uh, he'd say, she'd say, no, Davis has missed. And he's missed it. He just out of the depth, you know, frightened rabbits in the headlights. I suppose it was destined to go to the last ball. It was just destined because we... No, I don't think we made a ten break. Lee Davis, five. I think uh, I'd rather have one of my teeth pulled out without anaesthetic than watch any part of that final. I remember, God rest his soul, the great Cliff Wilson, the Welsh professional who was a great potter. I remember him saying to me, he said, I've never seen safety like that. There was a spell 
in that match where we kept flicking balls along the top cushion, hitting them very thin so that you wouldn't push it over a pocket. Our safety was good. Well, a terrific shot from Dennis Taylor there from that position. I had the job of presenting the Youth Cup each year and uh, Dennis won it two years running, I think. Mm -hmm. And the next year, another boy from the class beat him and he, he took it very bad. The, he wanted to win. Yeah. And Dennis wanted to win. Concentration written all over his face, looking for his first world title. Never rushed himself, never, you know, we... Had his, pace. Things, had his own pace and uh, even the, in football he was the same you know he took his own thing at his own pace but always got there if someone who you admire and look at thinks you know, they can do it you think to yourself I can do it too. I had to put the ball into the uh, yellow pocket run off side and bottom cushion, come back up the table, past a ball that was covering, yeah. and I underhit it fractionally, and I was using the rest. And I started to grip hold of the rest tighter and tighter, and we had a fight over the rest. I might have won it then. That was, that could have been that close. I was trying to run take your pick in the back room. <laughs> and couldn't see, I had two runners. <laughs> Every shot was played coming, you know, he's made a little break. The worst place that uh, Steve can finish is straight on the green. So they were saying, you know, you know <laughs> forget about take your pick. So I just downed everything, came out, and couldn't get near the TV. Couldn't even see the TV. Steve Davis's focus was amazing. I remember him fluking the green, and he just stiffly walked round the table and carried on as if nothing had happened. Steve wasn't really a human being. He was a machine. Steve Davis was built, trained, educated to win snooker tournaments, and he was a well-oiled machine. Eighteen points in it, twenty-two points on the table. This frame now been going fifty-five minutes the longest frame of the final. It was a very exciting match, and, and 17 year olds don't really like snooker, but I had to watch it, because I wanted to watch what was after it. When we got to the brown, I'd made my mind up then, right, this is probably the last chance to win the world title. Have a go at whatever's there, if it's any sort of chance, have a go at it. Dennis had a go. Very tense moments here now at the Crucible Theatre. The atmosphere in the place was, was alive, it was absolutely buzzing. You were seen often talking to yourself on TV. People thought you'd been touched with madness at some stages because it, it went on for that long. Well, it was a mixture of both. I was having a little quiet chat to my mum, but that probably the muttering would have been and Steve's friends who were up in the gods I couldn't see them we used to call them the, the Romford crowd they used to travel with Steve they were all you know nice blokes but there, there used to be seven or eight of them and they were up there and they had this Romford chant you know when you made a mistake you could hear coming from the gods come on Steve go on my son <laughs> They really did get me a little bit angry, yeah. angry enough to, to, you know, to keep me going without, without cracking completely. Moving the black just might help Dennis. He wants the four balls.
afford to go for the pot. He only wanted the one ball. He was 33 to 1 prior to the World Championship. Myself and a fellow from town here called Brendan Campbell. We had a £10 bet on, so he wasn't going to lose because we couldn't afford to lose £10. <laughs> The brown that I potted down the cushion was one of the best shots I think I've ever played under that sort of pressure. And then I'm left with the tricky blue. At this stage, the, the crowd were just, it, it was incredible. And the pink was, was, was quite difficult as well. Final frame, the final black. <laughs> now, I don't know why. Why I went and kissed the little lady on the on the top of the trophy before I took the double on and the black. I don't know to this day why I did that. It must have been I'm I'm going to win you here with this shot or I'm going to lose you. It was an unbelievably brave, stroke foolish shot to take off. It was, although if I go for the double and I miss it, at least I've, I've gone down trying to pull the double off. I have never known an atmosphere like this. Once again, please. John Williams, our referee, trying to keep the crowd in order. I didn't want anybody in particular to win. I just wanted a winner. And uh, if you like, let's all go home. A good one. You can train and practice all you like, but I think sometimes there's, there's, you get to maximum pressure and you can't get more than maximum, and maximum's enough for anybody. Dennis wouldn't mind my saying he chanced his arm and he's come out lucky. The fascinating thing about snooker is sometimes the best tension type snooker is the stuff where people are missing. When it's 100 break, 100 break, 100 break, and nobody's missing a ball, no tension. Really, in its own way, there's no tension. Everybody starts missing, the crowd get at it as well. So the crowd's at it, I'm at it, everybody's at it. We can't, nobody can hold their arms still. That was the biggest shot of his life. What a twitch. I missed that black by so far. It nearly came up and in the pocket I was leaning over. I went back to my seat and I thought, there's no way Steve Davis will miss the black. I always get a bit upset, people think it was closer than it was, but. You know, it was, it, you know, black was miles away from the pocket. <laughs> no, it, it was it was potable. I've come down. I thought, well, I've just got to keep everything together. You know, it's not your cue, it's not your legs, not your arms, and you just got to try and deliver it straight. When Davis has cut the black in, because this is Davis, okay? So I said, oh, I'm going to bed. I said, it's over. No. And I'm halfway up the stairs, and my wife shouted, He's missed it. I couldn't believe it. Hope is what happens, you go hope and outcome. And then, oh, dear. I, I can't comprehend it now that he missed it because uh, that isn't Steve. The one thing Steve has got apart from his ability to play the game is a wonderful temperament. This is really unbelievable. The way Dennis Taylor shaped to take that shot, it took forever to make up his mind that he was going to pot it. He didn't break, and Steve broke on that last ball, and that was just unbelievable. He's done it! Dennis Taylor, for the first time, becomes 
Embassy World Snooker Champion, 1985. He took that final black, which was the first time he'd been in front in the whole match. It lives in the memory so much of it because it went on so long and one of the players came from 8 nothing down to win on the final black in the final frame over 35 frames. The whole place here at the Crucible erupting for this very popular Irishman. You can't help but like Dennis, and so you're quite pleased for him wagging in his finger when you wanted to smack him straight in the nose. <laughs> that wasn't me. And all he was saying was, I told you I could do it. And a sad champion, Steve Davis, looks on. Having someone giving out all this, kissing the trophy, doing all this stuff, and you're sat in the corner, and then David Vine comes and says, How you know, how do you feel? Can you believe what's happened to you tonight yet? Yeah, it happened in black and white. <laughs> What do you want him to say? A fabulous picture of a very happy and popular man. The first thought is, I'm world champion. After all these years, I've become world champion, and it's a very, very special feeling. And then after that, I had no idea what was going to happen. It was the end. You know, that, there's no more balls. There were 17 days of playing for one ball at the end, and you can't do anything about it, and, and you, you've, you've messed it up. And that's, that's snooker. I suppose you look back on it 25 years later, sitting here now and, and have immense love for that occasion. Well, my thoughts, obviously, being the type of animal I am, I immediately signed Dennis Taylor, <laughs> which I think sort of sums me up quite perfectly, really, doesn't it? You know, it was great. <laughs> And Steve said, thanks, mate. And I had a few letters, I had a few letters from his fans saying, how could you? I said, there's a bigger picture here. It's a very small town. What did it mean for this place and its proud tradition and the pictures that adorn the wall of hundreds and hundreds of snooker players to have one win the world title? That was maybe one of the biggest sporting moments in that particular year and maybe years since. And as soon as he parted the black ball, we all became involved in that. You know, we were part of that. I had that good faith that Mummy was behind him and that she would see him through to the final, which she did. So that was constantly on your mind then, yeah. the whole way through, when you were sitting in the crucible yeah. and you knew it wasn't really yeah. about lifting that trophy, which is what we were all thinking. Yeah. He could be world champion. He could, And yeah. you're thinking something, and the family no. is thinking something, and Dennis is thinking yeah. something completely different. He's thinking that it's for her. It's not so much it's actually the, it's actually the world championship that he's going to be. It's going to be uh, a win for, for Mummy, and he did it. It's weird that People have won that title, Stephen Hendry seven times, yeah. Steve Davis six times, but yeah. for some reason winning it just that once seems to be... The once was enough for Dennis. As he said, you only have to win it the once to be, and you win it the once to be remembered, but it's one that he'll uh, it'll never be forgotten, I think, because of the situation and being on the black ball. Uh, everybody knows where they were when Dennis won the World Championships in 85. Mm. And, uh, and done with dignity? Something. With dignity, it was. Dennis Taylor. Snooker champion of the world. What did you say? <laughs> I'll tell you what. It's a good job the black was over the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I don't know, that's definitely well, the greatest match I've ever been involved in in my life. Has anything like that ever happened? In a match before to you, have you gone through anything like that of emotion and uh, tension? No. <laughs> to beat Steve Davis, who's been the best player in the world, well, you know, there's not a lot more you can say, really. Uh... Well, I'm the best this year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Davis and Dennis Taylor, who created a wonderful match here tonight. I think we both realised we were involved. There have been some great, great matches and some great moments in snooker. To win it in the way I did, it was like, it was like winning four world titles, that all wrapped up in one. People get what they deserve. He's a grafter. He grafted. 
got himself back. He, he worked on his technique a bit, never gave up. What more can you ask for? You know, well done, Den. In the 1985 Embassy Snooker Champion of the World with a cheque for £60,000 and the trophy, Dennis Taylor. I would need so much more than 59 minutes to fill you in about everything that I've learned on the journey across Britain and Ireland to discover the real story of the 85 final. But here's a couple of gems I haven't yet managed to fit in. I've learned that David Icke, despite having 30,000 people in a social networking group, doesn't do crowds. Me, I, I don't do groups, I don't do groups. I've learned that winners not only detest losing, but have very little time for losers. Oh, like, <laughs> Fiber. <laughs> These guys are going out for lunch today, courtesy of my bloody puggy. If he had a bit of bottle about him, he would have won seven world titles. I learned that one Northern Irish champion made a future one late for training. I was late for training the next day. I, I was late for training. I don't think anybody minded because most of the sparring partners were sitting watching it anyway. Yeah. I've learned that Mam is a snooker fan. She said she did follow the game of snooker on the block. And I knew that uh, the Duke of Edinburgh did because they had a table put in at Buckingham Palace. I've learnt that Dennis Taylor, just before the final frame, nipped out to use the toilet. 17 old Dennis left the, the arena, beckoned me to follow him. Never really thought we were going to go out to talk tactics or something. In fact, we just had a quick nip of brandy to calm the nerves. I've also learnt it's a bad idea to bet your student grant on a snooker match. It meant that I had to leave my rented accommodation because I couldn't afford to pay them and I had to sleep in a tent in Harlow Park for a month in the coldest spring for 50 years. You know what I learned above everything is how much it still means to people. No shortage of people who want to talk about it. And, and also, I think in both of your eyes, coming to the end of the journey and interviewing both of you, that you still feel it. So I'm thinking 25 years, a long time, right? Quarter of a century. I'm just wondering, 25 years later, just us three, we do it again. The, it. the, yeah, fi yeah, the that, final frame. That would be good. You've never run to lose. Let me just think. I'd love, to, I'd love to do it again. <laughs> what do you think? It's just us. We got the table here to set up. I'll break. You break. Yeah. Yeah. They created a piece of not just snooker history, but great British sporting drama. Any sportsman gives us something that goes into our memory banks, or gives us a warm feeling to say, you know what, I was, I was ever so glad I saw that. That was a bit special. And you know what? That was a bit special. Next, the leading men who appeared with Morecambe and Wise just for those plays what Ernie wrote. Then, in 83, the moment Cliff Thornburn made history, celebrating her birthday, it's 50 golden years of sport on BBC Two at 8.